to be here. I think it's been a couple of years since I preached, so um, happy that you guys could have me. I thought that worship this morning was great, so let's give them a hand. Appreciate it. Excellent. There was an old preacher that uh, was giving a session, and the session was entitled How to Preach a One-Hour Sermon with 15 Minutes of Preparation. So a lot of the uh, other preachers were gathered together. They wanted to hear how to do this. Children, oh yeah, the kids are dismissed. <laughs> And so the room was full of these young preachers. And so the, the old preacher, he looked at them and said, how you do this is you spend your life and dedicate yourself to your craft. And by reading the Bible many times through and preaching for years and years and years, you eventually can get to the point where with 15 minutes of preparation, you could preach a one hour sermon. And it's kind of the same way with musicians they spend so many hundreds of hours learning their instruments and learning the songs that they really make it seem seamless when they're up there, but there's, there's a lot of work that goes in behind the scenes, and I really appreciate them. And the sound man, too. Sound men are important. <laughs> yeah. So today we're in Luke chapter 15. Luke 15, the prodigal son. Luke 15. So while you guys are finding this, I have in my hands a pocket knife. I bought this pocket knife when I was about 15 or 16 years old. And it's nothing fancy. It says Jaguar on it. I have no idea why it says that, but that's what it says. I bought it at a Napa auto parts store. Uh, probably 20, let's see, how old am I? A long time ago, 20, 25 years ago. And uh, this little knife doesn't have much value, $5, 25 years ago. But it has a lot of value to me because it's actually one of the items that I've owned the longest. And the story about this knife, it's, it's little, it's light, it fits in your pocket. You don't really realize when it's there. And lots of times it would slip out of my pocket and I would lose it. Sometimes it would be gone for months at a time. I had no idea where it was at. I thought, well, I lost it. I lost it again. And I would lose it again and again throughout the years. And it would always come back to me. It, it's the weirdest little knife. And actually, I lost it uh, not too long ago. And my wife found it in the seat cushions of the couch. <laughs> and so it has great value to me because it's something that I lost and it was found again. And Jesus Christ is talking about the same principle here in Luke 15. He starts off with the parable about the shepherd that has 100 sheep and he loses one. And even though he has 99 perfectly good sheep, he leaves them behind to go find that sheep that is lost. Why? Because he cares about that lost sheep. And then he also talks about a woman who has 10 coins, but she loses one. And what does she do? She searches all over the house to find that lost coin. And she rejoices when she finds that lost coin. It's a great feeling when you think you've lost something and you find it again. And here we're looking at the prodigal son. Let's, do, uh, let's begin in verse 11 says, then he said, a certain man had two sons, an older son and a younger son. And the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this passage, God. I just pray that you'd help us to glean some truths from it this morning. Thank you for all these people that took time out of their week to come here and worship you and learn from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 
we see first of all a great waste you got two boys they're living on the ranch I believe their father probably had a lot of property he probably had a lot of goods otherwise why would the youngest son want those goods already uh, in the New Testament times land was king and the children of Israel would pass on their land through their children so that was very important typically the older son would get the lion's share that's just the way they did things and the younger son would not get as much but since this was probably a fairly large ranch he was kind of counting the sheep he was counting the goats he was counting the cattle and he said my dad has a lot of wealth he has a lot of things and I want those things and I don't want to wait for him to die that could be decades from now that could be 20 30 years from now I'm young now I want to live my life now and so he said I got this plan I'm gonna to go to my dad and I'm gonna say divide up your ranch between the two of us just like you were already dead I don't want to wait for you to die I want the money now so the father actually agrees to this I think this would have been very unusual culturally at the time but he divides his ranch between the two sons he gives the bulk of it to the elder son and the younger son gets his share but the Bible seems to indicate this is still quite a bit of money so the younger son gathers everything up he thinks this is great I'm 18 20 years old I've got all this money I can do whatever I want I've got all this freedom I'm in the prime of life I'm gonna travel and see the world so he sells his goods he's got all these goats he's got all these cows he's got these sheep he sells them for money and he decides he's gonna leave town because he's lived there his whole life it's a quiet sleepy little town nothing ever happens he's gonna go on a journey he's gonna see the world so everything's great for him he's got everything ahead of him and he starts spending the money he's spending the money on traveling he's spending the money on parties uh, the Bible says here prodigal living in other chap uh, other versions it says reckless living he's he's just wasting his money it, it's a waste he's wasting it at the parties and he's got all these friends because here he is he's young he's popular he's got money all these people are gathering around him he's taking care of them he's feeding them he's buying them drinks and boy it's a great time he's having the time of his life but he's young and he's foolish he doesn't know what he's doing he wastes it he wastes it all he journeys to a far country and there wasted his possessions so he wasted his possessions and he actually kind of wasted his father's possessions because they originally belonged to him so he's, he's living a, a wicked life he's running out of money and then what happens the money runs out and the friends run out everybody abandons him because he doesn't have any money anymore and if you don't have any money a lot of times your friends they'll disappear this prodigal son he had all these good time friends that they loved to party with him but as soon as the money ran out they were gone and when he had spent all in verse 14 there arose a severe famine in the land and he began to be in want this poor young man he's a victim of circumstance right he wasted his money and just when the money runs out the Bible says there's a famine there's a great depression that happens what a coincidence he's probably kicking himself saying I don't know what happened I was just gonna spend the money and then once the money ran out I was gonna get a job and make some more money but guess what things didn't work out as he planned he's probably playing the victim card here oh, you know I had all of this and then this recession hit this depression hit this famine hit and now I don't have anything you can see he starts out way up here he's the son of a rich man and then he gets his inheritance and then he parties and then he wastes his money and now he's starving it says he began to be in want then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine 
And he gladly would have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything to eat. I don't know if any of you have ever raised pigs before, or hogs, but I have, and uh, it is not fun. <laughs> any of you that have would know it. Uh, it's not, they're not clean animals to begin with. They kind of smell. Actually, they really smell. They really stink. And they're not kind, gentle creatures. If any of you have ever been around pigs, they like to bite. In fact, if you were probably to die of a heart attack, they would probably eat you right then and there. They're kind of vicious and uh, not a fun animal to take care of. So he's here in the hog pen. He doesn't have any money. He doesn't have any friends. The pigs are biting him when he's got his back turned to them. He's looking at the food that they feed the pigs, which is usually the worst food you can find. It's moldy. It's gone bad. It's spoiled. And he's looking at that food, and he's thinking, boy, that food tastes, looks pretty good. He's getting hungry. And uh, we see here a great humbling. It says in verse 17, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. This young man, he started out way up here. He was arrogant. He was proud. He was rich. He had everything going for him, and he ended up at the bottom, feeding the pigs. And sometimes that's exactly where God wants us to be. He wants us to be humbled because a humble person he can use. A broken person God can use. He couldn't use the prodigal when he was up here, when he was throwing parties, when he was having fun, when he was living way into the night. But now he's at the point where he can use him because he's been completely humbled. He's been completely broken. We shouldn't necessarily be afraid of being humble. Shouldn't be afraid of that. Let's go to Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3. You got uh, Jeremiah, and then Lamentations is right after Jeremiah. <coughs> Lamentations 3.27. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone and keep silent because God has laid it on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him and be full of reproach. For the Lord will not cast off forever, though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. I think we've seen this before, haven't we? The prodigal son is a parable. It's a story, but I think there's been a lot of prodigal sons throughout history. You see a lot of young men, they're proud, they're arrogant, they know it all. Maybe they came into a little bit of money early in life, and somehow, through circumstance or through their own poor decisions, life beats them down. It breaks them down. And maybe you see that guy and you say, I didn't like you five years ago, but I like you now, because I can actually deal with you now. You've gotten a little bit of humbling. You've been humbled. So God uses these circumstances, the famine and his own poor decisions, to bring the prodigal son to the point where he can use him. He's ground him down, and now he can be used. So he says, I will arise and go to my father, verse 18. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he's humble. He's repentant. Repentance means a change of mind. It means a change of heart. 
He's decided he's no longer going to live the way that he's lived in the past. He sees where it led him to the pig pen. He's decided he's going to make a change. And it starts with humility. Make me as one of your servants. And then it says he arose and came to his father. So we see here a great waste, a great humbling, and thirdly, a great father. And when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. This father has been going through a lot. He knows his son is wayward. He knows that he made poor decisions. His son just took off, went off into the countryside, disappeared. I don't think he ever even bothered to write home. He didn't know what happened to him. We don't say, it doesn't say how long he was gone, but I'm assuming it was probably at least a couple of years after all that had happened. He's gone for years. No word. Doesn't give word to the family. The father doesn't know what happened to his son. He doesn't know where he is or what he's doing. He just knows he's a lost son. People around begin to whisper. They say, I think your boy is dead. Nobody's ever heard from him yet. But the father, what does he do? Every day he looks out over the road that comes to his ranch. He's looking for his lost son. It says when he was a great way off, he ran to him. How is that possible? Because the father was looking. He was looking for the son, always looking. Every day he'd get up. He'd look down the road. Who's that coming up the road? Is that my son? No, it's not my son. The next day, who's that coming back? Who's that coming back home? Is that my son? No, it's not him. Year after year, he would wait for his lost son. And then one day, he looks way down the road. He sees a figure coming down the road. He recognizes the walk. Have you ever noticed, if you know someone really well, you can see them a long way off. Even before you see their face or anything, you can just tell it's them just by the way they walk. He sees that. He recognizes that, that walk, that posture. He runs out. He knows it's his son. He runs out and he kisses him. Notice he runs. In Jewish days and even nowadays, for an old man to run, that's kind of embarrassing. You know, men don't typically run. We kind of walk to where we're going. But this guy, he runs to his son. He doesn't care about the appearances. He sacrifices his dignity. He's willing to run to his son. He runs up and he kisses him before he even says a word. He celebrated his son's return. It says in verse 21, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to be merry so we see here they decide to throw a party he puts a robe on him he puts a ring on him he puts sandals on his feet his son was so poor he didn't even have shoes at this point he says Let's throw a party. Let's kill the fatted calf. The fatted calf. Let's have some veal. He was so excited that his son had returned. And that's really the point of this parable is that God wants us to be excited when a lost soul comes to Jesus Christ. You see, if you look in verse chapter 1 of this uh, Luke 15, it says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying. So he was telling these three parables as a rebuke to the Pharisees for saying, Why are you hanging out with these people? Why are you hanging out with these sinners? Why are you hanging out with these, these uh, ne'er-do-wells? So that's what the whole parable is about. But then when we look on, in verse 25, now the older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house, and he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked, 
what these things meant. And he said, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So the son is greatly offended by this, the older son. Because, first of all, his little brother hadn't done anything right. He had caused all of this harm to the family. He, took, he wasted his father's possessions. He embarrassed the family. He was gone all these years, and they never knew what happened to him. And now when he comes home, the older son is offended. He's offended because that fatted calf was his fatted calf. Remember, everything else belonged to him. So that robe you know, should have belonged to him. So he was greatly offended. We shouldn't be upset when we feel like we're, we're treated unfairly. The older son said, this isn't fair. Look at what he says in verse uh, 28. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to the father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a goat that I may make, make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours comes, who has, delivered, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. So he's upset. He's really upset. This isn't fair. I worked here my whole life. And when you gave me my portion of the inheritance, I still left you in charge. I was willing to wait for you to die. But now this younger son, he comes along and, oh, let's have a party. Let's celebrate him. So he's, he's really upset. Have any of you guys ever been in that position? I feel like I can identify with the older son a lot because I myself am an older son. I was, I was good. You know, I was the older son. So I think, I think some of us, some of us naturally identify with the prodigal son because we have had a checkered past. Some of us identify with the father because some of us have lost children or maybe we have a, a wayward child. But a lot of times we can identify with the older son too. Look, we've, I followed the rules. I did all the right things. And now you're celebrating this sinner and if we're not careful, we can become like the Pharisees. Because that, that was the problem back then with the Jews. They, they had the religion. They were doing a lot of the right things, but they despised everybody else that wasn't a Jew. They despised the Romans. They despised the pagans. They despised the Gentiles, which is anybody that's not a Jew. And so they had all these great truths. They had the Old Testament, and they were keeping it to themselves. Why? Because they despised everybody else. They weren't reaching the world. They were just keeping it all for them. And this is what Jesus is addressing. You know, if you get to the point where you despise a certain type of person or a certain class of people or a certain race of people, pretty soon you end up despising everybody. It doesn't just stop with that particular person. Because he was mad at his father. What did his father do to him? Nothing. But his father was nice to the son. And so he gets mad at his father. We have to be careful. We have to be careful if we have that attitude. And I've actually heard a lot of preachers say, oh, the older son, yeah, he's pretty good. He's the guy we should try to be like. But this is the guy that Jesus is preaching against. He's saying the Pharisees are this guy. We've got to be careful. Because even though he was being obedient... Even though he was doing the right things, his heart was in the wrong place. His faithfulness turned into stubbornness. And he began to grow bitter in his heart. All those years when the younger son was away partying, he was on the ranch. He was working. He was mending the fences. He was branding the cows. He was doing all this work. And every day, even though he was faithful, even though he was obedient, he just grew a little more bitter just a little more hateful. Oh, that younger brother of mine, Arr, he's no good. So we see it all just kind of piled up in his heart and came out. I mean, you could just see the anger in his voice. Or you can hear it. It says, you never gave me a goat. You never gave me a goat. 
that I make make merry with my friends. And he says, he devoured your livelihood with harlots. We don't know that. doesn't say that anywhere. They probably didn't even have any communication, but he's just assuming the worst about this rebellious younger brother, this, this prodigal son of his. Let's go to Luke chapter 18. Luke 18. This is an even more direct correlation to the message that Jesus is trying to convey. It says in verse 9, he spoke this parable to someone who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you, I'm not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This is the attitude that Christ was really trying to fight because he cared about the Pharisees. He did. He wanted to see them come to him too. But it's really hard to change somebody's attitude. Once that sets in, that bitterness, that hatred, despising other people, it's really hard to change it. And we see a few Pharisees came to Jesus, but not that many. And he was, he was really caring about them. So today, many lost souls walk the earth. There's a lot of rebellious sons out there. There's a lot of prodigal sons. What do we do with them? How do we handle them? Do we let them stay the way they are? Or do we reach out? These are hard questions. It's not easy. It's not easy choices to make. A lot of you are in this situation yourself. You have an estranged family member or a child that's gone off. How do we handle this? How do we react? And Jesus tries to address these questions. You know, you've got two reactions here. You've got the father who runs out and embraces his son, and you've got the older son who scorns him, who's mad at him. One believes in redemption, and the other one says, let the lost stay lost. I'm keeping this to myself. And you know, sadly, the church in America is failing. I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen the polls or the stats, but a lot of churches closed their doors because of the pandemic. A lot of situations where people just have stopped coming to church. And part of it is we're not reaching out like we used to. And it's not easy. It's hard. I'm 40 years old. I've met all the people that I care to meet. I've made all the friends I care to meet. And, you know, it'd be easy for me to just go in a cabin up in the woods somewhere and say, hey, I've done my part. And I'm sure a lot of you have done a lot more than I have. But God wants us to reach out to the prodigal. And while what we do is important, the attitude and the heart behind it is even more important. The older son, he was doing the right things. He was checking the boxes. But inside, he grew bitter. Inside, he grew hateful. We have to be really careful about how we treat those that we feel are less than us. Because we can be a prodigal son ourselves. I've been there. Some of you have been there. And it can happen in old age, too. It doesn't have to just be young men. It can happen to any of us. So we have to be careful the attitude that we have because we might find ourselves in that position as well. So will you welcome them or will you cast them aside? And that's really the question that this parable asks. So hopefully we will, we will welcome them. Let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this passage. I thank you for the lesson that it gives us. I pray, God, that you would help us to repent of the sin that we have in our own lives and to be welcoming of those around us. And Jesus, I just thank you for this church. I thank you for their faithfulness. I just pray that you'd help us as we go throughout this week.